We're back. It's another episode of Different Kind of Genius. Brought to you by Griffin Burger once again. They're fucking the best restaurant in Ballarat. If you're not eating <laughs> their food, you should be. I'm your host, Andre Kufe. And it's always someone special. This time it's one of the homies. And he really special. With me today, I got Daniel. Daniel Winton. What's, What's going happening, on? my brother? Chilling, bro. You chilling? Yeah. It's good to have you chilling. I know you just come back from your little holiday yeah, as well. Like back. you're all relaxed and you're all yeah. like you just chilled out. Pretty zenned out, bro. Man, it's it's important. We need to yeah. feel like that sometimes. Hundred percent. But if we jump straight into things, tell us what a man like Daniel Winton does. All right, a man like me, for people that know me, would think I do fuck all, but I do a lot. I work as a painter, painter by trade, um, on commercial sites. I do music. I'm a rapper. No, I'm more of a hip hop head. I don't like the word rapper, bro. Interesting. Yeah. So I'll, I do hip hop. Um, we'll come back to that. We'll come back to that. I like being creative. I'm a Buddhist. Um, I don't know. Nine weeks sober. Fucking oath. So I'm an ex, like, drug addict. An ex drug addict. Reformed, reformed drug addict. I wouldn't say I'm an ex drug addict because I still like drugs and shit, I just don't do them. True? Yeah. And I guess like that's a perfect segue, like why do you not do them? I owe myself better. Say that one more time. I owe myself better. You owe yourself better. Yeah. Break that down a bit. All right, so I haven't exactly always been so kind to myself, you know, um, <clears throat> and always just sort of lived in the moment without actually being present in the moment. Mm. You know what I mean? I do. So always just masking shit, always just like pretty much just always doing drugs. Yeah. To hide from something? Hide from to... myself. Interesting. Pretty much, I reckon, yeah. That's the realest shit I've ever heard too because I think that's why people do things, whether or not you be doing drugs, you be doing whatever you're doing. Mm. A lot of it literally comes from the cause of you're hiding from yourself. Yeah. What were you hiding from? Man, I honestly don't know. Like, now that I look back, being sober, I didn't really have much to hide from. Everyone has, like, childhood trauma experiences and all that sort of bullshit. But really, I think it was just, like, pressures mm. from, like, most part my dad. Shout out, dad. Give me an example of the pressure that you all got right. from your dad. <clears throat> so my father has extremely high expectations for me, which is cool. Like parents need to have that, I guess, because they want to see you succeed. <coughs> but it's like every time that I thought I was getting close to where he wanted me to be, he'd raise the bar. I'd try and reach that. I'd get close. He'd raise the bar again. So then I'd end up just being like, you know, fuck this, you know, and then do some shit. Because like obviously me succeeding isn't helping him like – Notice me in a sense. I think I did drugs to be noticed. Maybe, maybe by my parents, man. Maybe there's some shit there. I don't know. I haven't really thought about that too much. But I did it simply to escape reality, escape myself. Um, yeah. So what were the motivators behind getting clean? Um, well, what? first of all, I owe myself better. Um, Nas was a huge inspiration. So shout out Nas too. You're the man. Um, and just like, all right, so I read this interesting fact that was like, if you're still, if you've done drugs for an extended period of time and you get to the age of 25 and you're still doing the same shit, there's like an 85% chance you'll be doing that for the rest of your life. Fuck, that's real. Yeah. So I'm like, I don't want to be doing this for the rest of my life. Just always being unhappy. Um, and I always thought it was because I was an unhappy person, but I believe it was just the chemical imbalance in my brain. 100%. Yeah. 100%. Mm. And fuck, how did you even uncover that? How did you uncover that? Just a lot of, um, I don't know, looking inside myself. Awareness, man. Like mm. developing awareness. You know? And what, did you get that through like meditation or? Meditation, massive one. Prison, massive one. You got a lot of time yourself. True. So you got a lot of time to think and reflect. Um, also just the people around me, you know what I mean? Like people, I don't know. I don't know if I change up much. Do I change up much, Cody, when I'm on drugs? You go sly. I go sly. You go sly. Yeah, I become a sneaky cunt. Interesting. <laughs> well, I guess it's because 
<laughs> Which almost makes sense because when you're doing those things, yeah. like you have to be sly while yeah. you're doing them. Like you can't just go and buy it from like a normal shop. Like the whole process involved with everything, like that whole thing yeah. is kind of sly. Yeah. It's a shit lifestyle. Fucking no. Yeah. But um, so you're like, you even said a lot that I want to jump out there, but I'll get to that. <laughs> um, real quick, why do you like the term rapper? All right, because there's, there's rap and there's hip hop. Mm. You know what I mean? Rappers, I think Jamie Taylor broke it down. You know, there's like MCs and there's rappers. Rappers rap about some shit that's like catchy and whatever. And then there's hip hop, which is more, I feel like it's more universal maybe. I don't know. Like you're not limited as much, I feel. Mm. So I don't like being like, yo, I'm a rapper. You know, I think of rappers as like... <clears throat> Like cross color jeans, you know, them really fucking baggy jeans and like, I get you. yeah, you know, like Dicky, what are they? DC fat shoes and like, yeah. j- I don't know, man. Like rappers just like early 2000s rap. Yeah. You know, like, t shirt, yeah, yeah. flat caps and shit. <laughs> yeah, all like, that shit. Big ass chains and spinner chains yeah, and shit. Unnecessary. Yeah. Like you have a rim on your fucking chest. Yeah. It's like, bro. <laughs> that's, a, that's a chain, not a car <laughs> accessory. It's like, what are you doing? Literally. So I prefer, um, to say I'm a hip hop artist. Yeah. I guess that doesn't keep you boxed in either. It lets no. you do whatever you want to do. Yeah. Like I can't sing, but I'll give it a crack. Auto tune fixes everything. Mm. And yeah. how'd you get into rap? Or how did I get into rap? All right. Rap, so I got, in, I got into hip hop and I was thinking about this the other day. Um, the little Finnish chick actually reminded me of it. Um, Boom Funk's MCs, bro. Boom Funk's MCs. Boom, is that what it is? Boom, Boom, Boom Funk MCs. You know that, um, what's that song they had? Freestyler? Oh. Freestyler. Yeah, Bam. yeah. Yeah. I, I don't s- know, remember who, I can't remember the group of the, yeah. that, that made that, but I know um, the song. Seeing that video as a kid, and it, obviously back then they had like, I think I still remember there was a kid with dreadlocks, he had this remote, yeah. and there was like B-boys breakdance, and there was people in the cross color jeans, there we go again. But like, Seeing that as a as a young kid, I was like, "Whoa, that's cool as fuck," mm. you know. And that heavily heavily influenced me towards hip hop. And then obviously hearing like, I didn't like Tony Hawk's Pro Skater had the best soundtrack of every game ever. Bro, Tony Hawk's like that put a lot of things on. Yeah. So like the hip hop on that was dope as fuck, you know. Mm. Playing like Grand Theft Auto, all this sort of shit, man, and changing the car station just to the hip hop channel, yeah, every bro. Time. You know, every single you get, time, every the country you get one, you'd be like, yeah. "What the fuck is this?" <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, so man. always doing that, man. I don't know. Like, yeah, shout out Los Santos Radio. Yeah, shout out. <laughs> yeah. Um, that that was huge, but just like um, I don't know. Like I started started rapping, like writing shit as raps at like age of nine with like my best mate Josh. Josh. Lotta. He's from Melbourne. He's a cool kid, man. Yeah. So he was into Eminem and shit and I got into like 50 Cent. So I got into, I'd say, I guess I got more into like the rapper sort of bit than the MC sort of bit. Even though 50 Cent was dope, but Mm. Eminem was more of a lyricist where 50 Cent was more like, I don't even know what the word is for that. He was dope too. 50 50 Cent was was a hustler. Yeah. He was a man, bro. He was a hustler. Yeah. Like he knew what people wanted and he knew how to give. Yeah. People what they wanted. hundred percent. He had songs for clubs, bro. He had songs that you could bump in your car. He had the gang shit, bro. He was on all sorts of shit. So I don't know. Started writing raps and then just sort of fucking got into beatboxing and never really got into breakdancing or anything like that. But like um, beat production at a young age, I can't produce beats to shit, but like I got into like hitting drums and I don't know. Just, just always, rhythm. Yeah. Just really feeling the rhythm and then really got into rap at about... 15 I started writing raps I think I watched the Notorious Big movie yeah and I was just like I didn't really know of Biggie back then bro at all you know and I watched this I'm like who is this man I Mm. watched the whole thing and then I listened to his music I was really inspired and like then couldn't really write raps we got more into freestyles okay so like people tell me I can freestyle better than I can rap (laughs) like he's laughing back there but (laughs) it's true yeah Sometimes. (laughs) Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes. Sometimes. But like, um, so I got into freestyle, but then, I don't know, man, just got into like the 90s shit. Um, crack. That helped hugely. I and what know. year was that? 
that was like when I was like 17, 18, 19. Fuck. 20, fucking keep going, yeah. What circumstance, like <sighs> what point were you at in your life where that found you? Fuck, I was like, I was, I was clean for a little bit. I was still drinking, but I wasn't like doing anything. I started smoking weed again and shit. I was chilling at my mate's house. So I'd go to footy training, I'd go back, have a couple of joints because I didn't want bongs. I'd fall asleep and I'd wake up. And my mates would all still be awake at like five in the morning. And I was so oblivious to it, bro. I just thought they'd been chilling, smoking weed all night. Mm. So it got to the point where they'd, I'd be like, yo, like if you're still up, can you just wake me up? And they'd be like, yeah. And then that went on for a bit. And I had no idea that they were all on it, that, bro. Interesting. I had no idea. I've seen crack pipes. I've smoked speed and shit at a young age and that, but never been around that. And then one day, went to a party, came back. I think I was just about to turn 18. And there was like, they're all sitting around passing the pipe. I'm like, oh, yeah, fuck, I'll go that. They're like, nah, nah, nah. So no one really wanted to pass it to me. And then someone like blew a cloud at me and I took a deep breath in. And then next thing you know, I was, I was hoofing it and that. And like, yeah, yeah shit. Yeah, once you get a taste. Yeah, once it. you get a taste, bro, get into your soul. Fuck. Yeah. And then like, well, I guess as a kid, were you experimental with all that? Mm. Yeah. So like, it was just like you, was, like you said, you just started smoking weed again. So like, when did you first start all that? Started smoking weed when I was about 10 years old, bro. 10? Yeah. How did you come across, how, how did that happen? So I had older mates because I was friends with their little brothers and they'd come over and play and shit. Mm -hmm. And my mum was growing like a weed plant out the back, bro. I thought it was a tomato plant, right? Yeah. A little kid and that. I asked her, what's this, tomatoes? It was a veggie patch, but there was this one significant plant, you know what I mean? <laughs> the one that stands out the most, bro. The like, one that grows quicker yeah, than that. grows quicker than all the others, bro. <laughs> shit. It's got cool fucking leaves and that. And, um... My mate told me what it was. He's like, oh, fuck, and that's that, you know? So he was there picking buds off it, and I was like, oh, yeah. You know, just started getting into it, bro. And mm. then obviously having that, fuck, man, it's like the world made sense. Do you know what I mean? Like I always didn't feel like I really fitted in and shit. Like I guess I started younger as well with like Ritalin. Like, okay, yeah. So I think that's a huge, that's a gateway drug. Weed's not a gateway drug. If, you, if your kid's got ADHD and you're feeding that kid Ritalin, man, there's a high chance the kid's going to do drugs when he's older. What makes you say that? Because that's interesting. I reckon from personal experience, I didn't like how it made me feel mm -hmm. then. Fuck Ritalin. I used to take Ritalin. Shout Fuck out. Ritalin. Fuck Ritalin, right? It's all about Adderall. No, it's not about any of that shit. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so that didn't make me feel, made me feel normal. You know what I mean? And I've always been a bit of a weirdo, so I didn't like feeling normal, if that makes sense. So then when I you started- You didn't like feeling weird, so you did things to make you feel normal. Yeah, pretty much. And then started getting into drugs and it just made me feel like a higher self. Was that the first time you felt connected? Yeah. It's so almost the people that you were doing it with, it was like you'd been searching for your group. Yeah, because I didn't and really fit in that much. Mm. I swear I used to play with myself. That sounded really fucked up. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> play by myself at school and shit. Mm. Fuck. Um, fuck, I'm so sorry. Um, so when I did that, it was just like, all right, cool. You felt like you were part of something. Yeah, I thought I was part of something that was bigger than myself. Like, and then I don't know, you know, you just start going to parties and trying other shit and like. Mm. So yeah, yeah, if we bring it forward again. So after you tried it for the first time, like as you're about to turn 18, how long did that run last for? Fuck, man. All right. <clears throat> so I saved up quite a substantial amount of money for a 17-year-old. Yeah. I was planning on buying a really nice car and doing bits and pieces. And I tried this drug specifically. And um, somehow, can, like my father was going to Croatia with my stepmom and um, my two stepbrothers for like a month. And he was in control of my savings. You know, so I was like, all right. So every week I got paid, bang, straight into it, you know, and I, I lived off peanuts, bro, mm. enough to probably get a goon sack on the weekend and have some fun, whatever. And somehow <coughs> I convinced him to put the money in my bank before he left. So I was sitting on like 10 and a half or 11 grand. Fuck. Yeah. That's a lot of money for a young boy. A lot of money for a young boy that just tried ice, bro. So for the next month, man, it was a massive blur. It was like being in a movie. It's like I, f I felt like I had all the money in the world. And I could just buy all the drugs I wanted, all the clothes I wanted, skateboards, this, that, whatever, man, you know. And it wasn't until the money ran out and, I'm like, the people fucked off and that. And I was like, fuck. How long did that last? 
I like, think it took, oh, just a month. Yeah, probably a month, bro. I think Fuck. I spent it all in a month, bro. 10, 11 grand. Yeah, but I was sitting there like I just spent so much money on that shit, bro. And just smoked. Like I was smoking that much of it. Like I loved it so much. <laughs> that I got to the point where the people, I'm not going to say names and that, just, you know, that I was around with and that, like I'd be sitting just smoking, like smoking, smoking, smoking and, and pass it to them and they'd be like, they were disgusted. Do you know what I mean? They couldn't have any more and I just couldn't get enough, like. But then that would have beat you up inside because like, these are the people that I thought I was connected with. Yeah. Yeah. So what happened when the money ran out? When the money ran out, the real ones stuck around, bro. The ones that were there for the ride, they fucked off. The ones that were there to like, let's get your money back. So did some stupid shit. Yeah. Got yeah. the money back, spent it all again, mm. you know. And that was a vicious cycle for quite a while. True. And yeah. what stopped that vicious cycle? Fuck, what stopped it? I think I just got to the point where I was just, I remember actually specifically I was house sitting and the fucking hot water went out and I was like, fuck. And then the power went out and I was like, what am I doing here? Do you know what I mean? It was me alone in this house and everyone had fucked off and they're doing their own thing now. It was, I felt like, I was alone in, in the world again. Do you know mm. what I mean? And I remember laying in bed and I'd been awake for a bit and like I was looking at myself in the mirror and I didn't recognise who I saw. And then I thought, I'm like, yo, let me turn that on silent. That's all good. I was like, when I was a kid, man, I didn't think I'd grow up to be a fucking ice addict. Do you know what I mean? Mm. So I'm like, fuck this. <laughs> and um, I just like got on my shit, went to my mum's and um, she was living at my stepfather's house and him and I kind of, we got into like a fight, like a physical fight, you know, like a couple months prior to that. And it was pretty bad. Um, and yeah, I just went there and just surrendered myself, man. I was like, yeah, I need to get off this. So she literally like gave me weed and locked me in the garage, like locked me in the garage, man. <clears throat> and I have to call, I need to use the toilet. Fuck. And all I do is sit in there and I cooked it, bro. Like I was fucking, I don't know. She, she called me inside to show me what prison life would be like, you know what I mean, if I was to continue this road and go to jail or whatever. And like it was like America's hardest prison shit and they're sitting there making shivs out of glad bags and stuff. So for someone that's coming off ice and it's got nothing to do, what did I start doing? I start making shivs out of glad bags and shit, bro, you know what I mean? <laughs> just doing stupid shit, bro. And like, yeah, eventually I was just like, all right, I'm going to go to a party. Mum's like, is that cool? I'm like, yeah. I don't know, man. Like, it just, it's still so blurry. Do you know what I mean? Because yeah, I was true. like being so young and so heavily involved in all that shit. Like, my mind was fucked, bro. Like. Mm. Do you feel like you've paid, like, because of all the, like, damage, I guess you could call it, that you did at the start? Mm. Is that still affecting you now, do you think? I think I've kind of dodged the bullet, bro. Okay. Do you know what I mean? I've. I've been addicted to fucking, there's been times where I've been heavily abusing like acid, like psychedelics and all sorts of shit, like at age of 16, 15. And you'd think that would fuck anyone up, man. I've had friends that have just gone haywire, like, and they're cooked still from it. Mm. And I'm like, I'm still good. I think I've dodged the bullet. It might catch up to me. I hope it doesn't. Touch wood. Mm. That's glass. Fuck, there's no wood around. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but then, no, oh, well, fuck. But I don't know. Like, it hasn't really affected me because, like, I've always read books. I've always, I've always drawn. I've always, like, done things to keep my mind occupied. And I think having, like, ADHD helps a little bit as well as being on the spectrum with autism. Mm. Recently found out I've got BPD as well and shit. So I think, like, mentally. Wait, break BPD down. For borderline people. personality disorder. Yeah. How did you find out you had that? I went and did, like, this diagnostic with my psychiatrist because she was wanting to figure out my mind. Do you know what I mean? She's the first one that's actually tried to fucking figure out my mind. And we did it and I knew, I knew for a fact that like she was going to call me in and tell me that I had it and I was freaking out and I, and I kept throwing off for like three weeks. I'm like, I'm not going in for this shit, man. Like not at all because like um, I didn't want to know that I had split personalities. Mm. But then I went there and she's like, why haven't you come in? I go, I don't <coughs> want to know that. She's like, well, you don't. I'm like, 
isn't that what borderline she's like nah i'm like well, what does it mean then she's like it means you got like horrible emotional regulation so there's no in between there's no build up it's just like really happy really angry really sad really fucking there's no gradual yeah, it's, build. It's just bang bang yeah. yeah it's like almost like bipolar without being bipolar it's like yeah i never knew like I, yeah that that was interesting to hear you clarify that. Like yeah. Borderline personality disorder is just the inability to regulate emotions. Yeah. But on a serious scale. On a very serious scale, yeah. And I think like, yeah, like a few of us would feel like that at times as well. Mm. But it'd be different experience, like experiencing that all the time. Mm. But then with everything that you've gone through, it kind of almost makes sense. And then we're approaching this stage now when, like, now you're, like, what, 22 years old? 25, bro. No, no, but, like, oh, in wait, the story yeah. you're telling. True, yeah. So I was, like, yeah, I was probably about, no, nah, I would have been about 20. 20? 20, 21. So what did the next few years look like? Well, this is a thing as well. I never really took time out for myself because I always had, like, girlfriends and shit. And, like, oh, fuck, I've been a shit cunt, bro. Like, straight up, I'm so sorry to any of my exes. Like, <laughs> fuck, man. Oh, so like, I've always done shit to try and. I'm always too. What's the word? It's like, over compromising. Yep. You know, so I'll fuck up, and then I'll over compromise, and uh, so I'm a really good dude at the start, and then I feel like that's getting taken advantage, and I'm just like, yo, it's the same thing with my dad. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's just like, you know what? Fuck, it's not worth it. I'm gonna start doing some shit, cunt shit. <laughs> like yeah like, it's like, not worth it I'm yeah. gonna start doing some shit kind of shit <laughs> oh fuck there's my coffee um yeah so I never really had time for myself you know what I mean I always had a girlfriend I always did this I always did that I was always like you stayed either, distracted yeah always stayed distracted always rather be in someone else's head than my own you know and um what was the question so, like, what did the next few years? Oh, look the like? next few years. So, the next few years were like pretty chill. I had a girlfriend; and she was cool, um, and she, none of them liked me doing drugs. So, I was just like, "All right." So, I didn't do drugs for a minute. Yeah. But then, like, I was like, "You know, fuck this, man!" Like, I can get on drugs, and you won't know it. You know what I mean? Because I'm very good at hiding it too. But that comes back to the slyness. Comes talking back to the about. slyness shit. Yeah. Until I start losing weight and fucking all sorts of fucked up shit. But so I'm like, you know what? I can get away with this again. And it's the it's the feeling of like being sneaky, which all goes part with like the addicts, I think. Do you know what I mean? Mm. <clears throat> so the next few years were pretty chill. I had a job. I was doing really well. I had a good mentor. Shane, Shane Bo. Bo. Shane who? Shane Bo. Okay. He used to like um he he was one that really helped me look inside myself too, because he coached supercats and stuff for years and that you know what I mean. And he was my boss, so he's heard every excuse in the book. Yeah. So when I'm coming to work and fucking I'm trying to have excuses, he's just nut. Nah. He just he was like he could cut the air, bro. Mm. You know what I mean. So I'm like fuck. So I really just started going, yeah, all right, I fucked up this, this, this. You know what I mean. He'd be like, all right, I appreciate that, rather than the, oh this or all oh, that or oh nothing. Yeah, you know what I mean. He appreciates the truth. Yeah. So he really helped me cut the bullshit to an extent. You know, and like the next few years were pretty good. I was working. I had a, I had a girlfriend. I was gonna say I had a pretty good girlfriend. I had a girlfriend. Um. <laughs> Stop laughing, bro. <laughs> um, and things were looking good, man. You know, I was um, – there was a part where I was out of a job, backtracking before I got this job, and mm -hmm. I was still doing the drugs and this and that, and I was selling drugs, and I was living in Janjuk and, like, just living that lifestyle, bro, selling weed and doing fuck all, mm. live, live with a cop. So I was living with a cop and, like, selling weed and shit. That was pretty scary. Like, and like not small at me, I see the man, like we're moving, we're moving. You did what you had to. Yeah, I had to do what I had to do. And um, yeah, I don't know, I just, I had a bender and I was like, fuck this. Like my mate called me a crackhead because I was hoofing and I'm like, nah, like it really hurt, you know. So I was like, mm. fuck ya. Like I went and fucking moved out of his house and shit and just moved into my brother's. And I literally rocked up there like crying man like just fucking please take me in like i need to stop you know what i mean <clears throat> and they took me in and everything was good they're like you need to get a job you need to do this and it was cool like i fucking 
I got a job, like I saved my money, I grinded hard, I saved my money, I bought my first car, I was fucking, you know what I mean? I had a missus, I was doing things, bro. And then, then the, then the bullshit happens again, bro. You know what I mean? It's like a vicious cycle, which I recently found out is, is led by me being a depressed person, mm. you know? So like every time I feel like I'm worth something or like I'm doing something, it's just like this little voice goes, you don't deserve this. And I'll, I'll fuck my life faster than like. So what happened this time? What happened this time? I think it was just the pressure from the girlfriend maybe. I don't know. I'm not going to point the finger and blame her because it's me. At the end of the day, it's me. Mm -hmm. So I think it was just me being unhappy and I'm one that gets complacent in situations, man, like any situation. I'd rather just sit there and and like put up with it rather than go, I, I owe myself better or like, you know, so I just sort of fucking – and I allow – is it – there's like empaths and – what's the other one? I don't know, empaths, someone that like – will take like you'll take be empathetic on. or you'll be yeah, sympathetic but like, yes you know so i'm like constantly just trying to like help or something man and like the more well, i try to help you, yeah yeah the you'd more rather I try to look after them. someone else than look after yourself. so then i become a very unhappy person and then that eventually leads to me going well i don't want to feel like an unhappy person so i'll do what i know makes me not feel anything mm. you know but um it ultimately happened because my boss went away for a month. It's yeah. like the same thing. You know, my dad went away for a month. There was no security blanket there. Yeah. Bang. My boss went away for a month and I started smoking weed at this point again, you know, and I was like, oh, I can get away with it again. And then, yeah, like while he was gone, I started getting back onto the drugs. And then when I was getting on the drugs is when the assault happened. True. Yeah. True. And you've already fucking gone through so much and it's like now this is just like, Here's one more fucking shit experience. Yeah. But elaborate. What elaborate do you mean? Elaborate on that. This, like so my boss was coming back literally Monday. Do you know what I mean? I'm like, all right. So in my head, the sneaky shit comes back in. Do you know what I mean? He's mm -hmm. gone for a month. I was working by myself and I'm like, fuck, I can get away with this again. You know, like it's like the security blanket's thrown away and I'm like, fuck yeah. Like let's go have a little bit of fun. When he gets back, I'll pull my, I'll pull my shit back together. Mm. And that was the plan. Hopefully. Yeah. Hopefully. You know, because I had other plans. Like I was saving my money. I was going to move to like Canada and do all that sort of shit and just live my life. And, and um, yeah, and then the assault happened. So I went to my mate's 21st and I got on the drugs. I was addicted to like armadafinil. If you've yeah. ever heard of that. But break that, like what does that do for people that don't know? So the people that don't know what armadafinil is, I don't think you can get it in Australia. I think it's, it's a study I, drug. Is it a study drug? It's massive yeah. in unis. Yeah. So, fuck. I can't even explain the feeling of it. It's like, you can do anything on that shit. You know, the Limitless Pill, the Limitless Movie, whatever. Yeah. It's like that. Well, that's how it makes you feel. You can think like you wouldn't believe. You've got energy. You just, you're confident. You just, it's, it's crazy, you know? And it but, says like, hey. But... But there's always a but, isn't there? There's always a but. <laughs> but um, it said only to have one pill a day. You know, my mate was like importing it from America because you, I don't think you could get it in Australia at that point. Mm -hmm. And like I started buying them like flat out and it was like one pill a day. That's all you need. And then there's me being like, no, nah, I like drugs. I'm going to eat like four today. I'm going to have five today. Or I might get some Valium too. You know what I mean? And just like constantly eating it the butt is I, you fucking feel good you can't sleep i don't know if that's with everyone but that was with me so the best way to feel good in the morning is have another one and it just reboots you, you yeah know? but then you go days days and days and days you know and then you have to like not have one to sleep well this is for me personal experience so then i don't have one and i'm fucked that day but i'll get a sleep in and then i'll wake up and like i'm rested i'm good i have another one you know and this is all behind like my last ex-girlfriend's back too, you mm. know. I've probably fucked myself at any woman that's watching this, bro. <laughs> no, no, no. But like, like, we're still not finished yet. So it's like there's still a long way to go. Mm. There's still a long way to go. So I was on them. I had pills, like ecstasy. I was smoking weed. I was drinking. Had a bit of speed. Just a concoction. 
and I was at my mate's 21st and I was already pissed off about some shit and this is where I learned like there's like insignificant factors that lead to a significant, Circums, yeah. yeah, you know. And um, So what are you saying there is a whole bunch of little things that, happens before yeah, something big happens. massive happens. Yeah, so there's a, there's a gradual build up of shit that will make you like do something stupid or, you know, um, and that might be like if someone robs a bank, you know what I mean? They could be like they're arguing with their partner about finances. You know, they've got bills coming out their ass. They're fucking car, bro. you know, little things. It's like, you know, fuck it. I'm going to go get an urn, bro. Like, mm. so there's all these little things that happen. And then I was out and I was trying to have a good time, but there was this disconnect again because of the mental. And one thing led to another and like there was an argument and I was like, fuck this, you know, the assault happened. And I didn't think too much about it at the time. Do you know what I mean? Like I've punched people in the past and it's been cool. Well, it's, it hasn't been cool at all. Like it has, I'm not going to say it's been cool because it hasn't been cool, you know. You um, learn very quickly that every yeah, punch has a consequence. 100%. Like violence is not cool at all. Like any kind of violence, verbal, physical, sexual, fucking psychological, anything, any kind of violence is not cool. But like when I said I've punched people in the past and it's been cool, it's been like I've, I've punched someone and... There hasn't been any significant like impact from it. They might have like a raspberry on their face or something like that, or they might be scared of you, which isn't cool either. Like, why would you want anyone to be scared of you? You know, yeah, you're just waiting for someone tougher to come and yeah, show you exactly. why they're tougher. Exactly. Like, if you want to be cool, just be a cool person. But I wasn't thinking much of it. <clears throat> I um, went outside, joined the party again, fucking drank. I remember I was having a cigarette out the front. Ambulance come, cops come. I'm sitting there going, "What the fuck's going on?" And then I'm hearing like, he's on his deathbed and shit. And then I clicked, bro. I'm like, fuck, I need to get the fuck out of here. You know what I mean? And then my mate came and told me to leave. And like, I found the first distraction, which was my ex-girlfriend's drunk friend. And she distracted the shit out of me. And like, yeah, like, it was scary. It was fucking very scary. What, when you left? Yeah, because I was shit in my pants, man. Do you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. Yeah, you've seen cops, you've seen ambulance. I've seen it all. You're hearing you know someone's I mean? on their deathbed. Yeah. You're just like... What's like? Uh, what's next? I was like, I am fucked. Do you know what I mean? And I'm like, holy crap! Like, I hit out. Like, I, I stayed low key as. I went to my mate's house actually after it, and I don't know how I got past this massive dog in his backyard or something. But like, I woke him up. I told him what happened. He told me to come around the next day. I woke up in the morning. I didn't remember shit. And then I got told what happened. I was like, fuck. I'm like, nah, no way. You know. And then I went to my mate's house and chilled there all day and just blazed. And he was telling me it was going to blow over. And then the news come on and it was this dude. And I'm like, dude, this is not blowing over. Then there's the death threats that follow. Then there's all the, like, I was off social media for a bit and that. Yeah, it was pretty fucked. It was probably, it was more fucked for him. And I'm really fucking sorry that that happened to him, you know. And mm -hmm. I haven't actually had the chance to, like, I haven't crossed paths with him again. Is this an opportunity, bro? I like, I would, I'm lost for words at the moment. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because it is still such a significant thing, you know? And I'm, and I'm fucking truly am like sincerely sorry for what I did. Like with every part of my body, I wish I could take it back at the same time. And I don't mean this in any disrespect. I like, I wouldn't change a thing, you know? Because if I did, then I wouldn't be the person that's sitting in front of you right now. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So run us through the consequences of what happened. So the so consequences what did you, what of happened what happened when you realised you were fucked? What, what happened when I realised I was fucked is I was, I was hiding out, man. I knew the cops were after me 100%. And I remember at his house and it was a Sunday and I smoked weed all day and I got butt off him and I went back to my ex-partner's house. And I couldn't sleep, obviously, because I was like, man, I've killed someone. Like, the news said that he was on his on life support with, like, 80% chance of dying. And I'm just like, who the fuck am I to, like, do that to someone? Do you know what I mean? Like, and there was no ego that went with it. There was no, I'm, I'm a sick cunt. There's no, like, there's none of that. It was, it was pure fear, bro. You know what I mean? I'm like, I've ruined my life here. And I had all these goals and aspirations and shit I wanted to do, like going to Canada and stuff, man. I'm like, that's all out the window now. I go like, 
So I remember chilling at her house and I said, look, you don't like me smoking weed. That's cool, but I need to. Like, I need time for myself right now. And, like, I went to her car and I was, like, just smoking hongas in there, bro. And, like, for people that don't know, a honga's a bong in Australia or a chipper or anything like that. Like, yeah. And I was like, fuck. And this, I remember this car drove past real slow because I was watching the car. So I was ducking down, having a chipper, jump back up. The car went past real slow. Ford Territory, bulk up, metal, grey colour. I remember that. And I'm like, that was weird. The car went this way, car went that way, and then the same territory came past again. I'm like, fuck, they know I'm here. So I chilled out for like half a, went inside, jumped in bed, wake up in the morning. She organised for me to go see a lawyer straight away. I think her mum did actually. And um, me being me, like stubborn as shit, I used to be. I think I still am. But I was like, she's like, all right, we're going straight there. I said, no, nah, I want to go and get changed. I've been in the same clothes for like two days now. Do you know what I mean? I want to go and get changed. So I stopped home and that's when I got like arrested. So I was going to the lawyers to get advice before I went and hand myself in and I got intercepted in between. Mm. So I was like, whatever, this sucks, you know. So I went in and did the interview <clears throat> and I was just honest. You know what I mean? Like That's all you can be. Yeah. You know, I wasn't going to sit there and, and try and act like I'm some fucking badass that's going to sit there and be like, no comment. Like, nah. You know? So I went in there. Yeah, it's like they haven't grabbed you for no reason. Exactly, man. You know what I mean? Like, if it was with my mates and I did some shit, I'm not lagging anyone, bro. You know what I mean? If it's me, I'll own it. 100%. So I went and owned it. <coughs> and I got charged with... They tried to stick me with manslaughter because they thought he was going to die. Mm -hmm. But obviously that wouldn't have held in court because he, he wasn't dead. So I got charged with four counts of assault, um, intentionally caused serious injury, recklessly caused serious injury, intentionally caused injury and recklessly caused injury. And all that stemmed from one punch. And all that stemmed from one punch. And um, yeah, I got given bail to the next court hearing. I went to work Tuesday because I had RDO on Monday. So I got pinched on the Monday. Went to work Tuesday. And upon arriving, like, they told me Monday that I'm lucky because they were going to go to my work. Yeah. But they went to my work, man. So when, like, you've got, like, I think it was, I don't know, like homicide detectives or something like that going to your work, bro, asking for me. That's not a good thing, man. You know what I mean? So I go to work Tuesday and my hand's all bandaged up. Because, like, there was a big cut on my head and that. And I get there and my boss was back from his holiday. It was the day he got back. And he was just like, come here. And I'm like, what's going on? He's like, what happened? And I was just like, fuck. And I told him. And he's like, all right. He goes, look. Like, um, another boss, Dinko. Whoops. I mean, yeah, cool. He come in and he was like, look. He goes, um, who are the people that are, like, on top? Like, human, what are they called? Like, the... Um, HR? Yeah. They're like, look, they're sending security to get you escorted off site and I told them to get fucked. He said, I'm going to go and ask you, like, you, you can't be here. It's a liability for the hospital because I was a maintenance worker at the hospital. Yeah. He was just in case there's, like, a family member here, like, and you're working on, like, level six and they come up and abuse you. No, we're not, we're not having that. He goes, you've got holiday time. Take that. You've got trade school. So it worked out that I still got paid for a month. Yeah. I finished my last week of trade school at the same time. I got signed off. And um, all this shit kept happening, right? <clears throat> then the next weekend, right, I wasn't allowed to see my ex-partner, Bella, because she was like a witness. Yeah. Like crown witness, I think it was. She went crowning on me. Shout out, Bella. <laughs> but so I wasn't allowed to see her and she was the only person I wanted to see. You know what I mean? She was like, yeah. Um, so I'm at her house and she left some stuff there. Like she printed off all these photos and left some stuff there for me to look at. And like I was all emotional and shit. And she was with her friend Beth. And I can't get incriminated for this now because it's done and it's bullshit. But I was asleep in her bed. I was talking to her mum. Her mum and I had an awesome connection. Um, she was like my mum, you know what I mean? And I fell asleep in her bed and I got woken up, right? And I got woken up by Bella. And her friend Beth. And I'm like, what the hell's going on? 
and Bella showed me a pregnancy test that was positive. And I was like, whoa. And then I remember, like, I think she was like, do you know what this means? I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was still half asleep, so I fell asleep and I woke up. And then I just went, fuck. You know, like, I may have just taken a life. I've just lost my job. And now my partner's pregnant. Mm. You know, that's a lot of shit to absorb in one week, bro. Bro, that's... And then, like, none of that, you're on <clears throat> bail, so something's coming. And I'm coming. on bail. So I'm sitting there thinking, Fuck. Like, wait, Liam, go tell them just in case. Yeah, I'll just, yeah, it's too loud. Yeah. So, yeah, I was just like, who am I to like take a life and then bring one into the world, man? So, me doing what I do best, I just go and get on drugs. Can't deal with it, so I fuck off and go and deal with it how I know how to deal with it, you know? I still man the fuck up, but you know what I mean? Like, I was looking at, um, I could have gone straight to jail if I got caught with her, but I was still at every, like, um, ultrasound and all that sort of shit. Yeah. You know? Um, yeah. And then court comes. And court comes, bro. And, oh, yeah, that was different. Started off in, um, what's, what's like, is the it magistrates? magistrates? Yeah. yeah. And then I had a lawyer that I was paying for, used up my savings in in like not even fucking 30 minutes of court, bro. You know what I mean? So the money I had saved for Canada went two two court fucking things, bro. Like mm-hmm. two court hearings, you know. And then I got, um, obviously I had no money. No one would put me on for work because of what I was going through, you know, as well as like just the whole other fucking, I was mentally, I was, yeah, mentally I was fucked. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? As well as doing drugs on top of that and trying to figure out what the hell I'm going to do with my life and everything else. Like, Unless people have gone through it, I don't think they're going to understand. Do you know what I mean? Like the idea of going to jail if you haven't been in jail is like fucking scary as shit, you know, because the stigma around it, bro, like you're going to get raped. Like <laughs> I just, think that's the biggest one, bro. <laughs> like, like, there's, there's just nothing positive get, yeah, about it. Yeah, there's nothing positive. You're going to get beat up. You're going to get raped. There's going to be big dudes. Like, And I was a skinny cunt, man. Like I was like... So skinny, man, like 68 kilos, same height, long ass hair. Mm. Like I looked like an attractive woman for a man that hasn't seen a woman for a few years, bro. You know what I mean? Like, So I was like, fuck. <clears throat> but so what did the judge give you? The judge on my sentencing, I went to three sentencings. Um, it got adjourned. It got adjourned again. What does adjourned last... mean for everybody? So adjourned means that... Uh, I think it's like put on hold. So they, they sort of like, I think, like pause the court case until another hearing mm-hmm. so they can gather more information and whatever, whatever. And when I got sentenced, I got 18 months. Yeah. I put in a plea, an early plea. Um, so I got three of the assault charges dropped and I pled guilty to intentionally cause injury. And my barrister said that that's the best he can do. But I got lucky because I didn't get charged with a serious assault crime. Because if you take the word serious out of the crime, it's no longer a serious crime, even mm-hmm. though the crime was still serious. Does that make sense? Like, it's just legality. It's just like, like it's just legal wordplay, bro. Yeah. So 18 months. And when she said that, like, I felt my heart in my stomach. And I was like, I started thinking, like, how long is that? That's ages, man. You know what I mean? Like, and then everything else was so quick. Like I got, you get ushered out of the courtroom, fucking you're shackled. So you're in an elevator. Next thing you know, you're in this glass box and you're getting strip searched and all sorts. And I hated getting naked, man, like in front of anyone. So like getting like forced to strip down, bro, was just like, fuck. It's like dehumanizing and like humiliating and, and cool. That's part of the process is to show you that you have no rights anymore, you know? And then you get put on a bus and you're in a space like... So this is all literally happened when the judge oh, sentenced bro, you. Yeah, you're sentenced like, and then you're gone. No goodbyes? No goodbyes, man. And all this from one punch. Yeah. So, yeah, next thing you're on a bus, you don't know where you're going. Um, then you end up at the MAP, Melbourne Assessment Prison, where they just fucking find out like who you are, religious beliefs, um, if there's any dietary requirements you need, 
all this sort of shit, your height, your weight, like any tattoos. They take photos of your tattoos in case you're like gang related and shit like that. And then they know where to like segregate you to and stuff like that. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I remember getting there and I was fighting back tears all day, man. I'm not ashamed to say it. I was scared and I was emotional and I was fighting back tears, bro. And like, you got to have a fucking poker face. Do you know what I mean? I don't know if people don't feel anything towards that. Like, fuck, man, you're crazy. But like, I was like an emotional wreck. Jumped in the shower, stripped down, get in the shower. As soon as I jumped in the shower, it was like running water. I'm like, I can cry now. So I started to cry, bro. And then I got kicked out of the shower. And I was fuck. like, fuck. And I'm like, Ugh. like bottling it up. And fuck, man, you get, I got put straight into a cell with a dude that spoke fuck all English. And next thing you know, it was like, I don't even know what time it is. And it's daylight and why am I locked in? When do we get out? He said, tomorrow. I go, well, fucking how long is that? You don't have a watch. You don't have a phone. You don't know what time it is, man. Even the TV didn't have the time. So I'm just like, fuck. Oh, so you've got no concept of anything. You had, much. at the start, no concept of time or anything, bro, you know? And then when you let out, it's just like, what the fuck am I in for right now? Do you know what I mean? And like, yeah, scary as shit, bro. So what was that moment like the first time the cell doors opened? The first time the cell doors general, opened, like. General pop. The first time the cell door opened, I was in a holding cell at the map when I was getting assessed with these three dudes that were from Mildura that knew my cousin, or one of my cousins, you know. So as soon as that cell door opened, like, I think it's basic human instinct of survival kicked in. I'm like, I need to find these dudes. Do you know what I mean? Like, they're the closest thing that I'd have to knowing anyone in here. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? And they've been in and out of jail. So I'm like, fuck, they know the ropes. So I went and found them and I just started walking with them. And he's like, oh, little man, yeah, you're cool, blah, 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 blah. But like you had to fight for fucking breakfast, man. What do you mean? So like run downstairs and like you might get a piece of toast. Do you know what I mean? You might get jam, otherwise you're eating like dry ass bread, bro. Like, yeah, like it was pretty fucking, it all happened so quick though. Do you know what I mean? Mm. You're like, literally in the courtroom. Yeah. Next minute you're in prison. Yeah. You're being locked away. Yeah. Everything that you've once had has been taken away from you and you're just left there and king. Fuck. Yeah. You're wearing a shit green tracksuit and you got like, it's just shit, bro. There's there's no good that comes from it. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's just, it's the worst thing you can do to a human being, bro. Emotionally so, and psychologically, it's the worst thing you can do to someone, bro. And like, what, I guess, fuck, I don't even know what question to ask next, but it's like, in what ways did you get tested in all those areas over 18 months? All right. <clears throat> so start, I got tested like... I got put into maximum security for six months. I was supposed to go to medium security. So there's maximum, medium, and open farm. Like there's A, B, and C. So A is maximum, B is medium, C is like open camp. And I went to maximum security for six months, Port Phillip. And I've heard like horrible shit about this place, man. You know, horrible things. I was like, fuck. So I was tested by, I don't even know how to explain it really. I've boxed. Yeah. So the first thing I did is like, I can hit a bag and I can hit a bag hard. So to eliminate me having a target on my back, I'm going to go show everyone in my cell block how fucking hard I can hit. So they leave me the fuck alone. Mm. Do you know what you I mean? hope. Yeah, I hope. It doesn't exactly work out that way. People see that you can hit a bag and they want to fight you. But like spar. Do you know what I mean? So I was tested by having to spar a few people and they want to take your head off. Mm. Do you know what I mean? It's not friendly. It's like, let's you're fight. You're in prison, bro. Yeah. It's like. And you're fighting with bag mitts, bro. Anyone knows what they are? They are fucking knock gloves, man. It's like UFC shit, bro. So I was just like, I need a box here. Yeah. So I started doing that. Um, I was tested like by my ex. She broke up with me. In prison? Yeah, like three weeks. But didn't what break up with me. Just stopped coming in. Stopped answering calls. Stopped doing all that shit. And it hurt. It really hurt. And um, the reason behind that is because... I, was, I lied so much about drugs and shit. Do you know what I mean? So she thought she that was everything angry. was a lie. Yeah, she was angry. She had her reasons, you know, and that's cool. Like, I get it. I hold no grudge or anything. I heard at the time, but then you get past that, you know? Mm -hmm. So I was tested emotionally there. I was tested physically. Every day. Every single day. And I was tested psychologically, I think by like... I don't know. I got into like Buddhism and meditation there. Okay. So that really helped a lot, man. 
like to How slow. did you find that in there? All right. So before I went into prison, Buddhism found me. I fell asleep at Josh's house, Josh Davey. Mm-hmm. After getting stoned, I woke up and there was like a light coming through the window and it was lighting up this one book. Like, believe it or not, you know, like, you know, that you read signs and all that sort of shit. It actually happened. Do you know what I mean? Like there was this one book, it was called Wide Awake and it was a Buddhist guide for teenagers. So me being how I was mentally then, I picked the book, I started reading it and it spoke to me, you know, so I was like, fuck, I read the whole book. And then when I got there, I found out that there was church. I found out there was NA. I found out there was AA. I found out there was fucking Anglican church. There was fucking Christian, Catholic. Oh, this is within prison. Yeah, there was like Jewish church. There was all sorts of things. And there was Buddhism. And I was like, true, I'm going to go do that. So I went once and I meditated with a monk. Um, his name was Hojan. Good monk. Really good dude. And then they wouldn't let me go back until I was like, until I changed my religion status to Buddhist, you know? Okay. So... When that happened, I started just meditating every day, you know. You got all that time to yourself. I got all the time to myself, yeah. So I started doing the meditation and then I approached him. I said, I want to like, is there any kind of like baptism? I didn't know, you know. He's like, we can do a refuge ceremony for you, which means that you're like religiously Buddhist. Yeah. But Buddhism is not a religion, if that makes sense. So he broke it down for me. I was like, all right, how do I do it? He goes, study. Read every fucking um, Buddhist script you can. Meditate every single day, and when a name comes to me, it'll be time. I was like, I did exactly that. And then, take how long did that take? Three months. Three months of meditating every day and reading books every day. And so, just, you're doing that while juggling life while in the juggling maximum, life security maximum security prison. prison. Yeah. I was the dude that was sitting out in the yard, long ass hair, meditating and not giving a fuck what anyone thought, bro. Do you know what I mean? Like, so I was tested there and then <clears throat> I kind of got over like maximum security big time. <laughs> Bro, like, <laughs> like <laughs> you're not going to enjoy your time there. Nah, like I started having f- fun, do you know what I mean? Like, but at the same time I was like, nah, I started training and shit and I was like, I, I just got over it. I was like, I need to go somewhere else. Change is as good as a holiday. I was like, fuck, I need to go. So I wrote to SMU and they- What's SMU? Sentence Management Unit. Yeah. So they're the people that decide where you go in jail. And um Yeah, they like they in my cell block, it's like the lady that runs it runs it for first time offenders. Yep. So I was in a cell block called Pennine in Port Phillip Prison, which is for people ages eighteen to twenty five and it's their first time in prison. So her idea, which is an excellent idea, and like I have so much love and appreciation for her, is to keep you out of mainstream criminals like eyes or some shit like that. Do you know what I mean? So you've got your own yard, you know what I mean? Everyone gets a single cell. So there's like single cells, two outs and three outs. And um, a two out is like two cell, like two beds and a three outs, one with three. You know what I mean? So that's the number of people in a cell. Yeah. You can either be one, One, two two. or three. Okay. Yeah. And um, Pennine was all single cells. So there's a top tier and there was, I don't know, I think there was 35 cells in, in Pennine. And there was like one, two, three, four, five, six, probably maybe 10 on the bottom. So there's 25 up top. Yeah. And um, I got moved down bottom really quick because I was like, I'm a painter, I'll paint sales. Yeah. So every single day to keep myself busy as well, I was painting shit. You know what I mean? Yeah, I so practiced. you made sure you got a job. So yeah, you straight away, you know. And I like, it worked for me, man. But she has the idea, which is an excellent idea to – to help rehabilitate you. So while you're in there, you need to do programs to help rehabilitate you, to show you, you get skills. You know what I mean? You have to be working to be in there. You have, you, there's certain things you have to do, requirements you have to meet. And I kept hearing about SMU. Like if you want to leave, you need to write to this. Cause she put a hold on me. So when I went there, I said, I don't want to go to Marganite, which was where they were going to send me. So I sort of shot myself in the foot. She's like, why not? I go, cause I, I know too many people at Marganite. You know what I mean? And I don't really want to associate with these sort of people, you know. Not that I wouldn't like to spend time with them, but I don't want to associate with that. I feel like if I'm going to be here, I'm going to have to be the best version of myself. Mm. But like, um, yeah, there was no, like it had every every fucking number for like every prison that you want to write to, like um, like ombudsman's you need to write to and stuff like this. But there was Other nothing. Ombudsman. Yeah. Yeah. But there was no SMU, man. And I'm like, what the fuck? So I went to work and I told the bloke at work, I go, there's no SMU in my cell block. He goes, well, I'll get the number for you. So then I had to wait another day. I wrote three letters to him. She read all three letters, bro. Do you know what I mean? She still sent them out. But then like, 
they came to see me one day. I was at work and I got the phone call. Like, you need to go back to your cell block. I'm like, why? And they're like, oh, SMU's there to see you. I was like, yes. I was like, thank fuck for that. You know what I mean? Because I had a mentor called Mark, Mark Aisbert. Good dude. Um, was he another prisoner? He was another prisoner. So he's they the, body you up. Yeah. Like, uh, in, in the cell block, you have mentors, which is like someone that's done quite a bit of jail and they come in to be like, hey, you don't want to live this life, blah, 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 blah. Where it's probably more like I can get a single cell. There's going to be heaps of food. I can do easy jail. Fucking grabbing that. Do you know what I mean? Met this dude called Mark and he, he just like, he was drawn to me. You know what I mean? And like, I just wanted to listen to him. And he was involved in some shit back in the day, like unbelly sort of shit and that, you know. Um, so I was like, fuck yeah, this guy's a legend. You know what I mean? Like, ugh. Um, and he told me to go to Beechworth. That's why I started writing to SMU. <clears throat> so I went down, I started talking to him. They did an assessment and that. And they asked me, do you have drug problems? And I was like, oh, yeah, I do. Because there was Darangol, which is in Shepparton, and there was Beechworth, which is in Beechworth, Aubrey, Wodonga, like way up near the border. Just sticks. Yeah. High country shit, bro. And they asked me if I had drug problems. I'm like, yeah. They're like, well, you're going to Beechworth. But then there was the anticipation. You know what I mean? I was like, fuck, when am I going? Because I don't tell you when you're going till that mm. morning. You know what I mean? Oh, so like you literally wake up, they'll yeah. be there and you like grab you all your shit. Yeah, pack up. You're out. Sweet as, you know, and that went on. But I was pretty, because I complied a lot, you know what I mean? Like I said to this one prison guard, Haley, I'm like, can you let me know, please, like the day before so that night I can pack up and I'm ready. She's like, I shouldn't, but I will. I'm like, all right. And then we're all getting locked in. So they do the count at the end of the day. They shut your door. And um, she come back through and the trap door opened up and she was like, you're going tomorrow. And I was like, legend. So then I was all excited and shit, bro. You know what I mean? I'm like, I'm going to this and that. So I got to open camp and it was just like, wow. What do you mean you got to open camp? So it's like a farm. So it took like four hours. Wait, just real quick. How long have you served of your 18 months by this point? Six months. Yeah. Yeah. So six months and then I was going to open camp and Beechworth was the one. And that is not a jail. It's a run of That's like what a is fucking it? retreat, bro. A retreat? Yeah, man. Like, it's just, shit, I'd live there, bro. Really? Yeah. Like, not in the same circumstance, you know what I mean? But, like, fuck. Yeah, not under, like... Yeah. <laughs> not serving a, like, a conviction. Yeah, not like, serving fuck. a conviction, man. But, like, I don't know. You get there and you get off the bus and there's no walls. You've been looking at concrete walls and razor wire and fucking metal and shit for days and dirt. And you get there and you're like, holy fuck, there's actually birds chirping. And, like, it was really hot. And, like, everyone's just, like, free roaming. You don't see any prison guards. You know, you're like, where am I? You start using like steak knives and shit, man. Like, you're like, fuck. So I met Mark there and he's like, hey, come have dinner with me. I'm cooking steak. I'm like, oh, dude, I'm vegan. Like, he's like, oh, well, we've got potato. I was like, yeah, sweet. He's like, go get your meal and come down to that. He's like, here you go, bro. And he threw me the knife. He's like, look what's in your hand. I was like, fuck. You know, because you, you, you get used to like, you shouldn't have these things. But then you're like, and they're all laughing at me. I'm like, fuck, this is cool. You take things for granted, like adjustable taps in your shower. You know what I mean? Like you can change it whether you want it oh, hotter or colder. Hot or cold yeah, it you take that shit for granted. Well, none of that in maximum security. Nah, man. Concrete floors and a button that you push for the shower. You don't even have a shower curtain, man. And your shower will fucking flood your room. So you need to like figure out some shit to make you like the water stay in the shower. So oh, it's fucked. It's so shit. Yeah. That's fucked. And yeah. then did you do the rest of your time there? I did the rest of my time there, yeah. And was it smooth or? It was pretty smooth, bro, yeah. I met some cool people, you know. But that's the part where I got too comfortable in jail. You know what I mean? Like, started, What do you mean? Like, <laughs> just started like having fun. <laughs> yeah. Like, I don't know, man. You, I started having fun, like fucking with people just because like I could, because I wanted to out of boredom. Um, I don't know. Looking back, like jail sucks ass, man. And I wouldn't recommend anyone ever go there. But fuck, you connect with people in there, man. And you have some of the best laughs of your life in there, you know. And you really just, because you eat good, you know. And you, and you train and, you, and you're and like, you're naturally happy, you know. It's almost because you have to pretend like you're happy. Yeah. So like, I think Beach Earth was a huge helper 
Like winter sucked because it was cold as fuck, man. Mm. Like so cold. Um, so what was it like when you got out? Did you feel uh, like it impacted your mental? When I got out, like there was your physical state at all. Yeah, so I was shitting my pants to get out. So you scared to go in there, and then after serving eighteen months, I was scared to leave. You know, there was no real transition period or anything like that. It was just like oh, they didn't have like an oh, like well, they an, say they do. You know what I mean? You do some stupid courses like ice effects. I don't even know like what to ex- like what to expect when you leave prison. Like they do things to help get the ball rolling, but at the end of the day, it's one day you're in, the next day you're out. It's like getting thrown in like really deep water without knowing how to swim. Fuck. Yeah, and it's really fucking overwhelming. No, but I mean. Do you feel like your time spent away has impacted like oh, your mental health? Yeah, it did severely. In what ways? Like, I think we touched on this one day about scars of incarceration. Mm. So you become almost institutionalized while you're in there. What does that mean? So I think it comes down to complacency and being like comfortable in your environment. You know what I mean? So you almost feel safe in there. And, um, shit, I don't know. Like, I can't even explain what it's like, bro. It's it's hard to put into words. It's actually really hard to put into words. Like, uh, like getting out, it was like being, like I said, being thrown in the deep water without knowing how to swim. It's like, it's like a bird that's in a cage that hasn't stretched its wings for so long. It forgets how to fly. Mm. You know, like, yeah, it's just. It's like almost freedom. What are you doing, Cody? This guy. Um, yeah, it was overwhelming, very overwhelming. Mm. And yeah. How'd you cope with that? I didn't. You didn't? No, nah, no way. Like I didn't at all. So I, what, do you almost reverted back to old ways? Almost. I stayed clean for like six months, you know. Like in jail or after? After. Like yeah. so I, was, I got clean three months before I got out. And then I was clean for another six months. I mean, three months after that, before I fucking started doing shit. But I think like me coping was me over compromising again. I was working seven days a week. I was always keeping myself busy. I was going to the gym. I was doing this. I was doing that. Just never really taking the time to sit and go, whoa, mm. you know, like, yeah. And I've never really spoke about it. So I don't know how to speak about it, mm. but it was fucking very overwhelming, like, very overwhelming man like too much almost you know and and you feel like you're walking down the street you're not being watched but you feel like everyone's looking at you like it's hard as to explain no it's it's a a significant amount of time like 18 months in that environment and then in almost like part of your most crucial stages of life yeah like you know when you should be like because i'm reflecting on that that time that uh, that same time period like i'm about to graduate uni like this next stage of life's about to happen. But for you, it's like everything's just been on pause. Yeah. And then you get back out and you're just like, fuck, mm. everything. Nothing waited for you. Nah. It was like that 18 months just blew by. Yeah, exactly. I think that's that's like spot on as well because like while I was in there, I literally thought the world was standing still. And then you get out and you realise it's just like even little things like my mates had new cars. Do you know what I mean? And all like... They were, they were living with their girlfriends now where before they were living with their mom and shit. Like, it's like I literally expected the world to wait for me and it didn't. Mm. And then it was I had to catch up. Do you know what I mean? And then there was also like people that, you know, even if you go on like a holiday or something, bro, like the people that you associated with before going away thought that you were still the same person coming out. Mm. Do you know what I mean? They don't. They didn't see or understand like the significant changes mentally, and emotionally. They could see the physical appearance, you know, and they were like, "Whoa!" But they didn't understand how much you grew while you were in there. Which is where he comes back to the scars of incarceration. Yeah, you know. So you get out, and you're a completely different person. But to them, you're not. So then, when you're not like complying to with how they want you to be or how they perceived you to be then you're on the outside. Do you Mm. know what I mean? Like, yeah, so it was me being on the outside looking in and then I was like, man, I want to be back on the inside. Do you know what I mean? Because I felt the disconnect again. So there's always like a disconnect between me and like people. 
you know, there was people that wanted me to succeed and do well, like Cody. Shout out to Shout Cody. Shout out Cody. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> and then there was people that expected me to be the same person. Mm. And then yeah. how did you deal with that? Fuck, I don't know. I just didn't associate with them, bro, you know? Mm. Yeah. Well, you had to, otherwise it was like yeah, repeat like, that stage of life again. 100%. Like, do you want to come hang out? It's like, well, if someone hit me up to hang out, bro, and knew that I was just doing shit, and I'm like, yeah, let's go get a coffee. They'd be like, no, why don't you come over? Well, I don't want to just come and watch you smoke weed, man. Because mm-hmm. then I'm susceptible to doing that. And I don't want to do that no more. Like, 100%. Like, that's that party that grew. Yeah. And they couldn't understand. They get offended. Well, well it used to be like, you know, well, yeah, it used to. Mm. You know what I mean? Not anymore, man. People change. 100%. Well, like, they have to. As exactly. you said, like, if you get to 25 and you're still doing that same shit, yeah. 85% chance of stopping, like, that's not a high likelihood of stopping no. anytime soon. Exactly. So, like, recently learnt, and this is huge for me as well, this, um, I actually learned in Byron, bro. This chick, I sat with her and I talked for a few hours, man. And the significant thing I took out of this conversation was <clears throat> grow or go. Grow or go. Grow or go. And I'm like, break that down for me. She goes, well, it doesn't matter how long you've known someone for, you could be best friends with them their whole life, you know. But if they're not growing with you, go. Do mm. you know what I mean? So now I'm on this thing where it's like either grow with me or fuck off, you know, because I don't want to do the same shit, man. There's no way I'm going to do the same shit again, bro. No way. Which is important too it's because after important. everything you've gone through, if you went back to any of that as well, like yeah. surely life and then your beliefs as well, you know how that will end up. Yeah, 100%. And you've actually experienced like the other side of the consequences of that and the yeah. most significant ones. Like people throw punches all the time. They're like, just get a bruised hand. You yeah. threw a punch and got 18 fucking months. Yeah, exactly. It can happen. It can happen to anyone. Don't think you're above the law. House always wins. House does always win. Yeah. It's so, not. Yeah, it's crazy. But now you've spun it all around. So now I guess like it. what's next for like what's next for you? What's next for me? I'm just gonna keep being sober. You know what I mean? Why is that important to you now? It's important to me now because it gives me like clarity of thought, you know, I'm able to think more clearly. Um I understand like like you said, the other side of things. Do you know what I mean? Um I don't ever want to go back. But if shit got too hard out here, I, I could. That's what another thing about scars of incarceration, bro, is like it creates a second world for you. Do you know what I mean? Not really. You don't understand that? All right, so I've been in once and it was the hard bit. Yeah. You go in twice, you already know. You know what I mean? Like you're already accustomed to that. Is that because you spent too much time in there where you were just like, and it's still sort of so recent where you're like, Maybe it was a little bit simpler there. Yeah, it was very simple. I'll never go back, but so what's next for me is... No, but I, like, oh, it's, no, that, that's interesting because <laughs> I've had, I've just had situations where young people I've known have been in this like same, similar spaces. Yeah. And one thing they've said is they enjoyed being in there because of the structure and stuff that gave their lives. And all of these yeah. like people that have told me about this, are all individuals that grew up without structure. Yeah. So like it. not every meal was promised, like not none of nothing mm-hmm. was promised. Mm-hmm. But in there they felt like they were at home because yeah. they got three meals a day. Three they had someone telling them to go to bed like yeah. and it was and it, and it, and it blows my mind cuz I listen to that I'm <clears> like <throat> you can do all that for yourself. Yeah. But they're like no, I can't. Yeah. It's like it's not until I'm in these times and then you just like you feel so sorry for them because you just mm. like like th- you can do all that on your own. It's like you don't like you don't even need to put yourself in what ever situations that was like brewing around you for you to end up like that. Like yeah, you don't need to do that again. Like you can literally go out and do that all on your own. Yeah, you can. Just some people can't, which is unfortunate. But it I is. don't believe in the word can't either, man. Because like you can do anything. Can't's an excuse, mm-hmm. you know. So like. And it sucks for people like that because I get it, you know. You do get your three square meals a day. You get a bed, you get a shower, you have your routine, you got a job, you got your friends in there. What else do you need? You know, you go outside and it's just like, you know, you save up 15% of whatever you earn in there. If you do six months, you might come out with 800 bucks. 
So what's your first thing you do? You're going to go buy some fresh clothes and then you, you've spent all your money. So you're going to go and do some crime, mm. which will get you more time. But it's cool because you're going in and out and you're used to that. Like, fuck that, man. Do you think if we had maybe better rehabilitation for people that got out? If there was a better transition process, hell yeah. Like if you've got nothing coming out, they give you emergency accommodation for one day. Just one day? One night, bro. Yeah. And then after that, it's, uh, it's up to you. Luck. Yeah. Like you get Centrelink, so they hook you up when you get out, so you get Centrelink, you know. But like people that, you know, in the ice effects program that I did before I got out, like there was probably 10 people in it, myself included. I reckon eight people put their hands up. Like when, and you do the program when you're about to get out. So <clears throat> they're like, oh, who's planning on using ice when they get out? And eight people threw their fucking hands up, man. It's just like, what the fuck? And what does the teacher, like, is she just like, she's don't just do like, that? Yeah, she's just like, why? Oh, you know, I like it and this and that. Fuck, I don't reckon anyone likes smoking ice, man. You know what I mean? It's like there's something else going on. Yeah. But these people don't even have the support. So it's like, no. and they're about to get out. So it's like, yeah, what are they going to do? Exactly. And they've got this money now. So they're going to go and do it. So it actually sort of makes sense in why everything just keeps repeating. Yeah. It's just a revolving door, man. Like if you're yeah. not like a brave enough individual to actually – because you have to go and seek all that help for yourself. Mm -hmm. And which like for you, you had to do that all alone. Like you had to go to Byron to like cleanse yourself, like yeah. just feel like you're connected to society again. 100%. Because like. it was like the first time I've been able to leave Victoria for five years. Mm. So the first thing I'm going to get the fuck out of Victoria, bro. Like – 100%. Yeah. So, but I don't know, man. Some people are just wide different, I think. 100%. You because know, like if you want to change, like the first part of wanting to change is knowing you want to change. But then it's, they're wired differently. But then at the same time, all they want is change. They just don't even know how to go about getting help. Yeah. And if the rehabilitation process isn't facilitated in that, yeah. nothing's ever going to change. And that comes back to what you said before is like they've got structure. So as soon as there's someone not telling them or not guiding them, they don't know what to do. Mm, they're just lost. Yeah. And you're like, that's, and then that, that philosophy blows my mind. Like, I'm like, we're all free to a sense of like, you should be able to make your own decisions. Like, yeah. Had like, what, what makes you feel like you just need to be waiting until you're told what to do? Yeah, exactly. It's like, where did you learn that in life? Like, no, like, no one, yeah. Like, no, like, no one's going to teach you like that. It's like, mm. you, like, yeah, it's fucked. They're just literally. Sad individuals. Hundred percent. Sad individuals that need help. And the same thing is like, <clears throat> they're the first people to turn around and say they hate being told what to do. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So like, you sort of sit there scratching your head, thinking, "What the fuck?" You yeah. don't like getting told what to do, but you prefer getting told what to do because you don't know what to do unless you're getting told what to do. It's just like what? It's a brain fart, bro. Bro, <laughs> and it doesn't <laughs> get any better. Nah, man. It's fucked. No, yeah. but at least, at least I'm proud of you, at least. Shot, bro. You were able to come so far, like, <clears throat> fuck, that whole time period would have been scary as fuck. Yeah, scary as. It and took the, a minute, but it took a minute to get me, me where I am now, and it's, and it's going to still take a minute to get where I want to be. Do you 100%. know what I mean? Like, we have this conversation all the time. Nothing yeah. happens instantly. Yeah, exactly. As bad as we want it to. The only mm. thing that happens instantly is when you get charged, you get fucking thrown yeah, in jail, and, and they don't waste no that. time at all. Yeah. And it's like... <laughs> It's just sad how that process is so quick. Yeah. But your release is just as quick with no help. Yeah, just as quick and no help, man. That's fucked. Yeah. So what, you're going to stay sober? Going to stay sober. Are you going to put more work on, like, into your rhymes? Going to put more work into the music. Going to be more of service to people, I feel, is huge. Giving back is huge. Um, Why do you think that's huge? It's a selfless way of being selfish. You know what I mean? Like me hoping someone can make their day which will make my day too mm. do you know what i mean like um i'm gonna continue to work i want to travel like i really want to travel and people are like oh you can't with the you fucking can man there's ways around everything do you know what i mean but it's just harder it is a little bit harder but i feel like it's only going to be hard if you make it hard on yourself you know what i mean mm -hmm. so i'm going to travel I'm going to meet some cool people. I'm just going to live life, man. I'm going to stop like limiting myself to what I know or what I think I know and start learning some shit and just try and remain teachable always. Um, really need to do some more music, but mm. fuck, I need to do that so bad, man. You've got to like, you've got to put your experiences into your story. Yeah. Because like 
as like as we've all found out today, like you've got a fucking story. Like your yeah. first <clears throat> twenty three years were hectic, and then that eighteen months from one single action mm. was even more just as hectic. So you just hope that the next twenty five years are just filled with nothing but positivity. Hopefully, hopefully I have twenty five years, bro. Hopefully, that's what I'm praying for. But no. it's funny though, because even like in jail, couldn't stay sober. I think I told you that before as well. Mm-hmm. Couldn't, man. Bup, buprenorphine, synthetic heroin. I think it's buprenorphine, and then ice at Beechworth. So like, well, and that's just all over jails. Yeah, it's fucked. Yeah, it's fucked up. Though. And you've got nothing to do. Nothing to do. So you, some people do drugs. I put myself up real quick because I lost a lot of weight and I hated looking skinny and shit. But um, yeah, staying clean's always been hard. But now I'm actually proud of myself. I'm not doing it for anyone. I'm mm-hmm. doing it for myself. There's no like girlfriend I'm trying to impress or some some friends that I'm trying to make happy or, or my dad or anything. I'm just doing it like because fuck, I owe myself better, man. Hundred percent. Jamie Taylor said that best. Yeah, he's I, like, you can never do like, especially in terms of rehabilitation. Yeah. You can't do that for anybody else no. other than yourself. Yeah. And if you're trying to do that for somebody else, it's not going to work. No, it never does because as soon as like that stops, you start. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, fuck. If you want to get clean, you got to do that shit for yourself. 100%. You know? Yeah. I think we're at that time of the day, Daniel. 100%. And I'm mad interested to hear what you have to say. All right. But what's one thing that you wish you were told as a youth? Fuck, I've thought about this question quite a bit and I've had quite a few different answers. But I think like if I was told one thing as a kid, if it was me telling myself one thing as a kid, just hang in there, man. Hang in there. Yeah, don't change a thing, you know, just hang in there. Like things will work out eventually for you. Read the signs. And just um, maybe just invest in yourself more. You what know? does that look like? So not investing in everyone else as much. Still invest in your friends and that, but take more time for yourself. You know, learn who you are as a person. Learn that you will fit in in the world. You know, don't try to make the world fit around you because you'll sit in there perfectly. Fucking earth. You know, yeah. But stay in your lane. Yeah, stay in your lane, man. Go at your own pace. And just like things will work out, you know, yeah. And they will. You just give like that's one thing we are promised, and that's time. That's it. And, that's, and it's like <laughs> it doesn't matter how shit a situation is. It's like you give it a little bit of time. Yeah. Things should hopefully spin 100%. around. Hundred percent. Stay positive, you know, because positive attracts positive. Mm-hmm. So see the good in the world, man. Not not the bad. Hundred percent. Yeah. And it it blows me away that someone like yourself can still even say that after everything that you've gone through. Yeah. Like, yes, you made your own fair share of mistakes, but like... Yeah, I fucked up a lot. Fuck, bro. But at the same (laughs) time, like, you're the one that had to deal with them all. 100%. And that's braver than so many others. Yeah. Like, everybody just makes mistakes and they get bailed out by other people. Yeah. But for you, you had to fucking cop all your consequences and deal with them. I copped a lot of consequences. That's another thing. Don't laugh, Cody, because I was going to say something stupid. But for anyone out there, I reckon, take accountability and responsibility for your shit. Don't always point the finger. Like, never point the finger. Or if you point the finger, start with pointing it at yourself. That's it. Because every time you point a finger, there's three pointing back at you. So just own your shit, people. You have to. Yeah. You really do. Especially That's these it. days. You're going to get exposed if you don't. So it's like, man. if you're lying, like, good luck to you. Yeah, that's it. Take my hat off to you. Keep well, the, the charade up as long as you can. And we all know how a charade ends. Never good. Never good. But fuck, Daniel, tell the people where they can find you. All right. You can find me in Whittington. <laughs> <laughs> the 3219. Yeah, the 3219. Nah. All right, so... If you want to see me on like <laughs> Facebook and stuff, um, Daniel Winton. Um, Instagram is d dot the dot artist. Um, SoundCloud. I haven't got any other shit up. All right, so stay tuned because I've got some music coming out in the next month or two. If you want to see me live, November first, uh, Wave Riders at the deck. Be there or be square or a circle or any shape you want to be. Um, oh, we're going to be there too So everybody pull yeah, up Yeah we're going to turn support. the fuck up We're going to blow the roof of the joint So just come through But um, same thing as Jamie Taylor said 
if anyone's struggling with any kind of addiction, feel free to shoot me a message. I won't say nothing. I won't judge. I've been there. I've done that. So I want to help as much as I can. Even if you're just having a bad day, shoot me a message. I'm not going to bite you. So like, yeah. That's real, bro. Real as. There's anything else you want to add to that? If there's anything else I want to add to that, um, yeah. Stop hating on people, people. You know what I mean? Like just just love everyone, everything, even if you think they're your enemies or whatever. Just love people. Like love them, you know, because there's too much hate in this world, man. There needs to be more love. Fucking oath, bro. Yeah, that's some shit I'm on at the moment, so... Stay on it, brother. Stay on it, bro. I wish you all the best. Thank you. Bless you. No worries at all. And Absolute legend. Fuck. Just everyone else out there, remember, every punch has a fucking consequence. Every punch has a consequence. And it's like, if you're going to throw one, fucking think about the consequence. Yeah, that's it. No face, no case. <laughs> that was stupid to say. <laughs> <laughs> not even that. You yeah, cannot maybe have a that face. <laughs> they'll still find you. Yeah, that's it. Don't do stupid shit. Like, think before you act. Always think because one moment of stupidity can have a lifetime of consequence. Fucking oath. You know? Yeah. And really think about if that's how you want your life to go. Yeah, that's it. But like, Daniel, I appreciate you coming on and sharing your I story, I appreciate man. you having me through, brother. Honestly. Like, it's not easy. No. And everything that you've dealt with, we've spoken about it so much as well, and that shit for you has not been easy. No, it hasn't been easy. It's been an uphill battle since day one. I'm just proud that you're able to keep your head high and do whatever you need to do. Yeah. To find positive in this world. Thank you, brother. I appreciate you. And it's important. Honestly. If anything's motivating, it helps everybody else around. It's like, well, fuck, Daniel can do it. Why can't we? That's it. Aspire to inspire to be inspired. 100%. Mm. 100%. But fuck, I think that's it for Different Kind of Genius this week. Thank you all for listening. Big ups to Griffin Burger once again for mm. holding it down. Go eat their food. 100%. And yeah, stay safe. Peace out. One love. See love. you next week. Liam, do that shit. You're the man, bro. Thank you so much. No